This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. From Microbe TV, this is TWIV, This Week in Virology, episode 668, recorded on September 30th, 2020. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast All About Viruses. Joining me today from Austin, Texas, Rich Condit. Hi there, Vincent. I'm just looking up the weather here. Dang, I'm slow. 69 degrees and sunny. Can you, well, I guess you hmm. you believe anything I say, Close. but it was it was less than 60 this morning, which is like amazing. It's great. Yeah, see, we're, we are at 17 Celsius, which is a little, 66, 67-ish Fahrenheit. 62. 62. Wow, you can do it in your head. It's the same as what it is here. Yeah. <laughs> I've written it down. Well, that was, that's the voice of our guest. Let me introduce him from, uh, the, from Colorado State University, Tony Schauntz. Welcome to TWIV. Thank you, Vincent. I appreciate it. Is uh, Shounce like sixty-two fair? Yeah, Shounce. Shounce. I've been good. called a lot worse, but that's good enough. So. <laughs> I, I took a guess. Um, it's sixty-two Fahrenheit, seventeen C, and partly smoky. Partly smoky, a new addition to the weather. Also joining us from Ann Arbor, no, southeastern Michigan, Kathy Spindler. Sorry. Well, and technically Ann Arbor is correct. Um, and it's fifty-five degrees Fahrenheit, thirteen degrees Celsius, and. Uh, either light rain or no precipitation, depending on which weather app you look at. And I closed my blinds about a half hour ago, so I don't know. We had heavy rain overnight. It woke me up a couple of times. But I love the pattering on the roof, right? It's kind of comforting because you're inside, you're not outside. And from Madison, New Jersey, Brianne Barker. Hi, it's great to be here. It is 63 Fahrenheit, so also 17 Celsius here. Um, and sunny. We learned that there are times when you do not smile and you're having tech issues like this morning. <laughs> <laughs> Usually you smile continuously, but when we saw your video, Kathy said, oh, she must be having tech issues. <laughs> yes, I was having a lot of tech issues. <laughs> okay, Tony, um, arthropod born and infectious disease laboratory in the Department of Microbiology, Immunology and Pathology in the College of Veterinary Medicine. Colorado State University. All that right? <laughs> uh, yes. College of Veterinary Medicine and Biomedical Sciences. All right. Uh, we'll get to you in a moment with some uh, history, but I just want to tell everyone, if you like what we do, can support it. consider supporting us financially. You can go to microbe.tv slash contribute. Many thanks to all of you who have joined in your support. Uh, one day I will thank each of you personally, um, uh, but right now I, I can thank you this way. And Kathy, chat with a virologist. Yeah, evidently it's still continuing to be popular. It's uh, readily accessible on the ASV homepage, asv.org. There's an image and near the bottom of that, there's four sort of tabs within the image. And one of them is chat with a virologist. That will lead you to how to access a curated list of virologists who could come talk to your classroom, your meeting, your book club, Etc. And um, next year's ASV is going to be online, right? Yes, it will be a virtual meeting. I heard your discussion about the terminology <laughs> virtual versus online, and I think you are outnumbered. <laughs> We're calling it virtual because then it becomes a virtual virology meeting. And so the alliteration is no, nice. I, I don't care. Um, and uh, 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 2022 will be in Madison, 2023 will be in Georgia. 2024 will be at Ohio State, and the we will be able to go to Montreal, but not until 2025. So that's when that's scheduled. I want to go back to Fort Collins. Work on that, yeah. please. Well, we I, were just talking to Tony about that. We need to work on them. They, the one we had there was great, and I love Fort Collins. And Tony, I have a, uh, a co-host on one of my other podcasts, Daniel Griffin, who comes on to give the COVID-19 clinical report every week. He used to live in Fort Collins and he started the biggest medicine practice there and was there for many years and uh, has, and then had, had to move back East for parental reasons. But uh, he has, always says great things about it. He loved yeah, it. It's a, it's a fantastic place to live. So. Yeah. I, I like it a lot. Although Especially I, if you're into biking and 
cycling and like to do hiking or winter sports. I was talking to your colleague, Greg Ebel, the other day, yeah. and I expressed the uh, opinion that I would like to live there. And he said, not now, it's too smoky. <laughs> <laughs> has it, has it, it hasn't right. affected the housing market yet. So, <laughs> Fred Murphy spent time there as well, didn't he? I believe was he that? did. That was yeah. before my time, though, yeah. Yeah. But yeah, well, almost everything in Fred Murphy's life is before everybody's time. <laughs> <laughs> Let's start with a little of your uh, history, Tony. Where, where are you from? So I'm uh, originally from Wichita, Kansas, uh, where I was mostly interested in uh, baseball uh, and uh, had hoped to get drafted, but apparently I wasn't as good as I thought I was. Ooh, what uh, position so, did you play? Uh, I was a catcher. Car, far uh, out. That's yeah. Great. That, that's, uh, there's a story about the baseball and the bats, the bat work that we do now. That I, you know, I can tell you about later if you're interested. Um, and then I uh, did my PhD at Kansas State University uh, and then a postdoc at Oak Ridge National Labs. Uh, and that postdoc was in mouse genetics. Uh, and I thought I knew a lot, but then I eventually moved to Western Colorado where I took a position at what's now called Colorado Mesa University. Uh, and I got into hantavirus research there. And that's what led me into deer mice uh, and that's when I realized the mouse is not a mouse, uh, that they are actually quite different. Uh, and then after a few years there, I went to the University of Northern Colorado, uh, in Greeley, Colorado, which is only about 25 miles or so as the bird flies from Fort Collins, uh, and spent a few years there and then uh, have been at CSU now for the last eight years. So you, uh, before you did this hantavirus work, you hadn't had any virology experience? Well, so... Uh, I was an immunology student at Kansas State for my PhD, and then uh, at Oak Ridge, I was looking at viral mutagenesis through uh, re endogenous retroviruses and how they can move and, and uh, localize near uh, proto-oncogenes, uh, and that was really the extent of my virology. Um, I, did do, I did work in the private sector for a number of years between my master's and my PhD degree, uh, and I did some viral vaccine work. But so I think the mashup uh, of disciplines of virology and immunology is cool. I'm no, I'm pe preaching to the choir here. <laughs> yeah. Can can one actually now get a degree in viral immunology? Oh, I think it's all kind of shades of gray, and so okay. I think that's perfectly uh, suitable and acceptable. I'd like to think that my PhD students have their foot in each of those, one foot in each of those areas. So I remember in the early '90s, you know, at the sort of as uh, molecular virology has had sort of reached its peak and the pathogenesis people were screaming and yelling about how they didn't get enough attention. Yeah. And I'm thinking to myself that, you know, immunology really and pathogenesis are uh, close to the same thing. Yeah. Um, and so it's kind of come full circle. It's great. Yeah. I'd also like to, I try to encourage my students to also do some field work because, you know, being in the lab all day long is, is great. You can have nice controlled environment and you can drill down on questions, uh, but it's like in, you know, if I can use a sports metaphor, it's like the home field advantage, right? And sometimes you need to go to the other guy's field and and, and learn a little bit how you are uh, in, in that different set of circumstances, because the reality of it is, you know, all of these zoonotic agents are being shaped by their ecology. Uh, and when we bring them in the lab, we immediately change the, the calculus and, and who knows what, where that might lead us. Yeah, Rich and I visited UTMB last year and they lamented the lack of field work and the difficulty in doing it and getting funded and so yeah. forth. Yeah, I agree. Is that a bat behind you on the shelf? Oh, yes, it is. Sorry. <laughs> what do you mean? Sorry. No That's okay. That's no apologies. Cool. Yeah, this, is, uh, this was a gift to me. Uh, I don't remember who as a, <laughs> as a mask. Uh, and it originally... <laughs> Originally came with a syringe, but we needed to use the syringe for something. I don't want to get into those details. So, very cute. It's not a. It's yeah, not I have a, bats all over the house too, uh, real ones and fake ones. So. All right, and baseball ones. Uh, a, yeah, a few <laughs> baseball bats. Yeah. So, uh, as we had mentioned earlier, we were going to. <clears throat> so after the ASV, which was planned for what was it, July, uh, Kathy? This yeah. year? <clears throat> June. You yeah. were having a bat meeting at Fort Collins, and we were going to come and maybe do a TWIV and you were going to show us the bat colony and all that is gone, unfortunately. But um, then I saw your paper, your preprint, which we'll talk about first, and it jogged me. And I said, let's get Tony on and we can talk about that. So uh, in a bioarchive, bio 
uh, SARS-CoV-2 infection, neuropathogenesis and transmission among deer mice, implications for reverse zoonosis to new world rodents. So I really thought that was cool and, and that's why you're here in part and then we'll talk about bats too. So that uh, let's start with deer mice. What are they and why do we care about them? Well, deer mice are probably the most abundant native species in North America. Uh, and the genus is Paramiscus, and there are more than 50 species of Paramiscus, and they're found uh, from the subarctic all the way down into Central America. And so many of them, I mean, they're, they're found uh, in, in lots of different ecosystems. And importantly, many of them have per peridomistic behaviors. In other words, they'll, they'll, they'll come right into your home uh, or into your outbuildings, and they'll try to set up nests. And of course, that's a big exposure risk if they happen to carry any viruses. You know, uh, most wildlife, if humans encroach on their habitat, they tend to, to move away. But some species are perfectly content and opportunistic when it comes uh, to those kinds of events. And with, in the case of deer mice, Sinombre, uh, Sinombre hantavirus is hosted by uh, this, uh, this species. And uh, it is the number one cause of hantavirus cardiopulmonary syndrome in North America. Uh, and so we have a species of rodent that is clearly very domestic, and we've now shown, as well as a group in Canada have shown that deer mice are susceptible to SARS-CoV-2. And so the risk is, and I think Ralph alluded to this a few weeks ago on the show, uh, is that if this spills back into wildlife, then there's the risk that not only could there be changes in the viral genome uh, that could lead to new genotypes of this virus, but if there are also other coronaviruses that circulate in rodents, then there's an opportunity for recombination events, for example. So you can get quite distinct genotypes out of that. Uh, moreover, it could transmit from deer mice to other species. And so consequently, we don't know what the impact on wildlife health, health might be. And then there's also those different changes that will occur because as we all know, when a virus gets into a new host, it has to either figure out a way to come to sort of a, an immunological detente with that species or the, the, the host is going to die or it's going to clear it by making an, an aggressive immune response. And so now there's a potential for secondary host establishment in the new world uh, in a way similar to how MERS coronavirus got into dromedary camels. And now camels seem to be the principal spillover source uh, of human disease. So that's our concern. Um, how likely is it this, this would happen? I don't think it's terribly likely, but keep in mind that deer mice are probably the most intensely studied uh, mammals in North America. There are a lot of ecologists that collect these animals. And if they're doing capture studies where they take measurements and then release the animals, if that person happens to be infected, then there's a possibility they could transmit that. Uh, and because we showed in our work that you could get sustained transmission between deer mice, uh, I don't think it's out of the realm of possibility that a spillback event could occur uh, and then establish uh, SARS-CoV in wildlife populations in North America. Have you so I wasn't that? really aware of uh, deer mice until the hantavirus uh, episode. When was that? Do you recall? So the uh, <coughs> the big outbreak in the United States was in 1993, 1994, uh, and it, uh, it, co it corresponded with an El Nino event the year before that led to a very large uh, uh, production of seeds. Uh, and very large increases in deer mouse populations. In some areas, it went up tenfold. Uh, and of course, because they're peridomestic, then they started uh, spreading out and getting into people's homes in the Four Corners region uh, here in Colorado and New Mexico and Utah uh, and Arizona. And that's where you saw that large outbreak, principally in, in New Mexico. Uh, and of course, now that we start, we've discovered those, we've found them virtually everywhere uh, in rodent populations uh, in North America. And they're at least a uh, a dozen or, or half a dozen or so species of hantaviruses in North America that can cause this disease. So there are my, lots my, more that we don't know that cause yeah. disease. They may cause disease, we just don't know if they do. My recollection is that, you know, there had been decades of field studies on these mice that all of a sudden had a new significance yeah, uh, because of the fact that they carried this virus. What's the, what has been the fascination with these uh, mice outside of virology? Well, I think mostly because they're a keystone species and they're generalists, right? So they're they're quite adept at, at adjusting to new environments, whereas you know a lot of species are specialists. And if you tinker with their environment in any way, you can really cause catastrophic outcomes for those populations. But uh, deer mice are quite uh, robust in their ability to adapt to new environments, and they're perfectly fine uh, living out in the wild or living in the in your basement uh, if you let them. So. 
So were ecologists at all convinced that they should maybe wear PPE, particularly if they're in the Four Corners area, and because of it being, you know, transported, uh, transmitted through air and so forth, even yeah. masks or right. n- or not really? So uh, that, of course, is an institutional decision, but I can tell you at our institution, if you're going to be conducting field work with uh, reservoirs of these viruses, uh, you're going to be required by occupational health to require uh, to wear the proper PPE. So you've mentioned field work. Um, do you work with these mice um, completely in the field or do you have a colony? Do they breed well? Do you work with them sort of similarly to other mice? Yeah, so here, here's the here's the story. So um, at one time we had, you know, we had been doing field work. Uh, this was uh, really a project driven by Charlie Callisher that I know some of you know. Uh, and uh, over the, and that was in the uh, 90s and 2000s. Um, and during that time, we established a colony of, of paramiscus, of deer mice. Uh, we had to, of course, trap them uh, at a site in Western Colorado, and then we quarantined them outside in these five gallon paint buckets uh, for about uh, six weeks. Uh, and then we found a couple that were infected, and so we just let those go. Uh, and then the others that were not infected, uh, this was by serology, uh, we brought those in to establish a colony. Uh, they they breed pretty well in captivity. Uh, some females produce better than other females, um, and so there's a lot of variation uh, uh, within the population. Uh, but they breed just fine, um, and we've done a lot of experimental work uh, in the lab. Uh, and of course, what I want to do is see if the findings that we've determined in the lab also apply to what's happening in real life, right? Because if you discover something in a laboratory environment, it's not happening in the real world, it kind of doesn't mean anything. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, as Rich mentioned earlier, these are, or, or, or Vincent mentioned earlier, these are the types of studies that are difficult to get funded because they involve a, a large and substantial field component. So the breeding is fine, but I lost my hantavirus grant a couple of years ago after having about 15 or 18 years of funding. And so uh, I had to get rid of my colony. Uh, fortunately, one of my former graduate students, who's now a faculty member at the University of Northern Colorado, she maintained a few of the animals uh, for some of her work that she was doing. And so we were able to get a very small number of animals to do this pilot study. Uh, and now they're ramping up their colony over there so that we can start uh, leveraging it uh, for additional coronavirus research. So at what, at what point during this process do you wind up with an inbred colony or yeah, something so- close to it? So we try to avoid that, you know, uh, of course, the, the beauty of it is, is if it, you sort of randomly move males and females around, you can sort of uh, maximize the, the genetic diversity within that colony. I can tell you that back in the, in the uh, uh, early 2000s, we tried to derive uh, inbred lines of deer mice, and we would get to around, oh, uh, uh, F5 or so, F6, and then they would just stop breeding. And I have two other colleagues of mine who independently tried to do this as well, and they ran into the same problem. So we think there was probably some inbreeding depression that prevented, uh, that reduced the fecundity and and prevented them from going any further than that. So my understanding of the outbred mice, mus musculus, um, may only have somewhere on the order of a thousand breeding pairs. Um, And some results we had early on indicated that maybe they're not even all that outbred but are you were you going out to the wild and getting more mice into the paint buckets uh, we, uh periodically or no we we wanted to so once you establish a closed colony right this is more of an animal husbandry issue right once you establish a closed colony you, you really don't want to introduce any new animals unless you have to have a have a really compelling reason to do so uh, uh, some people think that's okay uh, i don't happen to be one of those uh, because if you introduce new genotypes into your population that may change the outcome of your research and, and it makes it harder to say, this thing that we found today is directly related to this thing that we found 10 years ago uh, because you've introduced some new, new uh, genotypes into your population. So personally, uh, I'm not the one that, that really wants to do that. So, I wanna show you guys back in 2013, I visited uh, Jason Botton in Vermont and this is him here in this photo, he sinks 55 gallon drums into the ground and he keeps the mice in there. And you see he's got a BSL-3 uh, outfit on there. Wow. So these, yeah. these go down about four feet 
right? And he keeps them nice yeah. so that they're outside. And of course, you got a fence around them and so forth. Right. So this is at the Seviana National Wildlife Refuge south of Albuquerque. Uh, and each of these drums has inside of it another bucket, uh, and that's actually the nest box. And so inside that bucket uh, is where the deer mice are allowed to keep. And then this f- fence on the outside, uh, I don't know, behind Jason, uh, that also goes down about two feet into the ground because the fear was that if these uh, deer mice that are in these infected uh, uh, canisters, uh, if they escaped the cans that they were in, they could then get out from underneath this uh, 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 fence and get into the wild out of the Sevietta, uh, and they didn't want that to happen. So that was more of a safety uh, procedure that Brian Hella had in place down at the University of New Mexico. I remember asking So you mentioned, uh, you mentioned coronaviruses in the mice. Uh, th- this must have been assessed. Are there coronaviruses in the, in the deer mice and other mouse populations? How many? What so do you know about them? In, in Europe and Asia, there clearly are rodents uh, that are harboring uh, coronaviruses. In fact, uh, there's a study that was done uh, in Europe where they found a number of new alpha coronaviruses, and most of them had beta coronavirus spike genes. So there was clearly some recombination events that went on between alpha and beta coronaviruses. Uh, And those rodents were all also chrysated rodents. So deer mice are chrysated rodents. Most North American rodents are chrysated rodents. And that makes them quite different than the laboratory mouse and the laboratory uh, rat, which are mirrored rodents, right? So the Syrian hamster, which was the first small animal uh, model for SARS-CoV-2, is also a chrysated rodent. And it was that publication that sort of led us down this path to investigate deer mice because we knew they were chrysated rodents as well. And we had their ACE2 sequence and we put the ACE2 sequence up against the hamster and human sequences. We saw that there were these really important amino acids that probably made it likely that they're susceptible to infection with SARS-CoV-2. And I think a lot of the new world rodents are going to be susceptible to this virus because of the ACE2 sequences. Now, of course, there's more to infection than just the receptor, right? Uh, and there's a lot of other Amen. biology that goes on. Thank goodness. Yeah, there's a lot of other biology that goes <laughs> on. And so just because a virus can get into a cell doesn't necessarily mean it will lead to a productive infection. How are these viruses transmitted among mice? Uh, the rodents? Yes. Uh, the coronaviruses? Yes. Uh, I don't know. I don't know if anybody's carefully looked at that. My guess is that uh, they're mostly intestinal, so I would guess fecal oral. But uh, clearly with our deer mice, it's respiratory. Uh, and so I think that in our experimental model, transmission is principally through uh, uh, respiratory transmission because we see a lot of virus replication uh, in the nasal cavity uh, and uh, we see damage to the sustenticular cells, which is probably why they're, uh, they're probably losing smell, but we haven't devised an experimental a protocol to assess smell sensation uh, in our deer mice yet. So we're working on that with some other people who know a lot more than this about this uh, smell uh, business than I do. So in general, Tony, when viruses transmit by the respiratory route among mice, is it mainly by them contacting each other or is there airborne transmission? Yeah. Well? So we haven't done that uh, experiment. I know that there's a group at Hong Kong who's done that and they, they have shown that uh, there's a little bit of short distance airborne transmission that can occur between hamsters, but it's most efficient if there's direct contact. Uh, and of course, you know that all, all rodents, they're highly social animals. And uh, uh, that, that's what really facilitates transmission. So you have high densities and, and social behavior, and that's going to be a really good way of transmission of viruses. I just want to put a little bookmark here for the uh, listeners. Vincent just asked a question, and Tony answered, we have not done that experiment. This is science in action, dudes, okay? <laughs> we, we, we work on data. I love it. Yeah, yeah. we're data-driven. So tell us the, the experiment uh, infecting mice, uh, deer mice with SARS-CoV-2. Uh, how did you do it, and, and what did you find? Yeah, so uh, what we because we were sort of limited on the number of, of deer mice that we had available to use, um, I hope that's going to change in the coming weeks uh, because the colony is, is now getting expanded. Uh, we, we set up an initial uh, pilot study of 12 animals where we inoculated three. Uh, uh, well, we inoculated nine of them and we kept three uninoculated, sham inoculated controls. Uh, and then on days three, six, and 14, we euthanized three Uh, of those nine uh, uh, deer mice. So we had three different time points. Uh, And then what we found was that there was this uh, rather modest but 
clear pathology in the lungs. Uh, there seemed to be a dramatic destruction of the epithelial, the olfactory epithelium, which is very similar to what uh, Ralph was talking about a couple of weeks ago in their mice. Um, and we were kind of surprised that we found viral antigen in the olfactory bulbs of some of these mice. And so there's clearly a neurological uh, inv invasion. Whether that had a pathological consequence is for difficult for us to tell because the mice looked perfectly fine. They had no behavioral anomalies that we could see. Now, whether or not that meant they were losing sense of smell or uh, their ability to do memory recall was compromised. We don't know those answers yet. Um, those are all things that we would like to do. Uh, of course, it's all dependent on securing funding to do so. Um, and then once we showed that, we 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 did a we ex well first we examined the lungs for a number of uh, immune response genes, and it looked to us like there might have been an inflammatory cytotoxic T cell response that was going on because we saw elevated uh, CD8 expression, a little bit of CD4 expression as well. But importantly, we saw lots of IL-21 gene expression, which is a, a really important cytokine for getting cytotoxic T cells activated, uh, as well as a transcription factor called TBX21, which encodes TBET transcription factor. And that's the hallmark TH1 uh, transcription factor that facilitates uh, expression of inflammatory cytokines such as interferon gamma. Uh, we did detect interferon gamma uh, in some of the animals, but not all of them. Uh, and so we're not sure what that means. Uh, of course, the cytokines are active at picomolar concentrations. So even a little bit of them can go a really long way. Uh, so we're not sure if uh, that, that is a contributory factor to the disease. What we didn't find was much interleukin-6 expression. And of course, in humans, there seems to be a correlation between severe outcome in COVID patients uh, and, the, and the production of interleukin-6. And so this could explain why that we didn't see severe disease because there wasn't uh, much of the IL-6 pathway getting activated. So after we did that experiment, we then wanted to look at transmission. Uh, and of course, what most people do is they inoculate animals and then uh, a few days later, they move those animals to a new cage with naive animals and see if there's transmission and then they call it good. Well, my concern with that is if you inoculate an animal with a dose of virus that probably is far higher than what they might encounter in nature, you may be artificially forcing an issue, right? So like an unfavorable enzymatic reaction, you're going to, you're going to get a more efficient transmission. So what we wanted to do was see that it, those first set of deer mice could get infected by transmission. And once we detected that in the oral swabs, we then moved those mice to a new cage with naive deer mice to see if we could naturally sustain that. Uh, infection. And we would have kept going except we ran out of deer mice uh, because of, of the limited uh, numbers that were available to us. And so we're ex expecting to go back and revisit that. What was particularly fascinating to me was that in those second deer mice, that so the third round of deer mouse passage, uh, when we deep sequenced the viral genome, there was a four amino acid insertion in the N terminal domain of the spike protein. Uh, and it has nothing to do with the, the receptor binding domain for SARS-CoV-2, uh, but it's in a region that could either interact with some other cell surface protein, or uh, it maybe interacts in the homotrimer in some way on the surface of that virus. We just don't know the, what it might be doing at this point. Uh, when we went back to our original stock virus from BEI, that insertion was there. It was just at a very, very, very low frequency. Uh, we had to use PCR to detect it because deep sequencing didn't see it, right? You know, deep sequencing doesn't catch everything. So that's why I call it kind of deep sequencing because it sometimes <laughs> misses things. Um, but when we use PCR, it's clearly there, a uh, very low amount. But for whatever reason, once we passage it through viral cells a couple of times, and then in the deer mice, by the time it gets through three passages in deer mice, it's 100%. And that tells me there's something going on that's probably biologically meaningful, and we have to sort of figure out what that might be. So the mice uh, do not... Uh, die and they do not lose weight. Is that correct? Yeah, they lose they lose weight. Uh, and as in fact, the inoculated deer mice lost the most weight. The passage two deer mice uh, lost a, a little bit of weight, but not very much. And we're not sure if that's because we gave the the initial deer mice a large dose, right? Because we inoculated them intranasally with ten, uh, two times ten of the fourth virus, or if because of the selection of that uh, one insertion may have attenuated the virus a little bit. I should point out there were a couple of other mutations occurred that were uh, synonymous mutations. And so we don't think those are having any impact in, in this outcome. So we've now plaque purified uh, the wild type virus. Uh, this is the Washington State isolate, the first one that uh, BEI Resources was distributing, uh, as well as we're in the process of purifying the insertion virus so that we can see if there are any differences in how those viruses behave in deer mice. 
So you mentioned some cytokine responses, including a cytokine that I spent a fair amount of time thinking about. Oh, um, I'm in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so um, I just wondered if in this model, um, you have the ability to look at things like memory responses or kind of the longevity of responses. Can you do a lot of immunology in a deer mouse model? No, we can't. We rely mostly on uh, transcription gene expression profiling. And of course, as you all know, transcription is just one start of one part of this process. Um, uh, uh, cytokine genes, they can be expressed for a few hours and then uh, they typically have a short half-life, the messenger RNAs do, but the cytokines can persist, right? So if we kill a deer mouse on day six and we don't see a cytokine, it may have been that it was expressed on day five or it could have been expressed the next day. Uh, but because we sort of artificially chose to euthanize on day six, we could have missed it. Of course, it's also possible it wasn't expressed at all, and we can't we can't discriminate that. And this is why we like the idea of developing you know monoclonal antibodies to look at some of these cytokines, because then you can get you know persistent for some time uh, the presence of those proteins, and then that of course will also give you quantitative data on protein expression. So we're kind of restricted in that regard. Yeah. So deer mice diverged about 18 million years ago from lab mice and lab rat, rats, right? So lab rats and lab mice are pretty close related, right? Whereas deer mice are way over here. So evolutionarily, they're quite different uh, than lab mice and lab rats. How old uh, are these mice when you infect them and, and how long can they uh, live in a colony? Yeah. So this, these, these deer mice were about six months of age, which makes them young adults. Uh, and this, you bring up an important uh, component of, of deer mouse biology. And, in captivity, they can live up to eight years, which lab mice uh, and lab hamsters, you know, Syrian hamsters, they live about two, maybe two and a half years, and that's it. So if you want to look at studies of like durability of immunity, I think the deer mouse is probably a much more attractive animal model for that uh, because you can keep them for many, many uh, more years longer than, than lab mice that are expressing human ACE2 or the uh, uh, wild type lab mice with the uh, uh, mouse adapted uh, SARS virus that Ralph's uh, recently published. I assume aged mouse studies are on the docket. Yes, yes, but you know those are those are going to require RO1s because those are you know five five year experiments that have to be done and preferably eight year experiments, right? If you can keep the the deer mice long enough. Um, and so these are some of the challenges that we're facing. The uh, for the uninitiated out there, when Tony says RO1, that means money. <laughs> long term, means long a, term uh, money. And it means Big a five-year grant. Five-year, yeah. well, six-year, wink, wink, right? Right. I, I <laughs> want to mention to uh, our listeners that, you know, you may have heard that NIH got a lot of money to work on coronaviruses, but it's not so much, and they're really doling it out carefully. So yeah. I think this is just an unfortunate situation. A lot of this work needs to go forward and we're still being stingy and uh, of sh short, having no foresight. <laughs> it's yeah. crazy. Well, I, I understand the focus is probably on vaccines and therapeutics because it's a critical time right now, but hopefully once those are in place, we'll uh, get some more basic biology and environment. Yeah. So er everything that's, <clears throat> everything that's led up to our capability for understanding this disease and making vaccines is uh, basic research. And, uh, you know, it proves the, the yep. value of that and, yep. and that it needs to be supported. Yeah. And I definitely like to do more field work. Uh, Cause like I say, it's, it's fine to do all this laboratory work, but until you show it's happening in the real world, not sure it really means that much. Uh, sorry, I had to go away for a few minutes, but I don't know if anyone asked you, have have you actually looked in wild uh, deer mice for SARS-CoV-2 yet? Yes. Yeah, so we have an R21 that we're submitting uh, to sort of do a, a surveillance for not just SARS-CoV, but for other coronaviruses, right? Uh, because we would like to stay ahead of this in the event, you know, the unlikely event that this virus spills back into nature. Uh, I'm not going to say it's impossible because we've already seen it with MERS and dromedary camels, right? Uh, but if it were to spill back, then uh, we could have some potential uh, issues uh, with that. And so we're we're submitting an R21 with the hope that we can land a little bit of money to at least get a, a field study started uh, and look for other coronaviruses. And, and importantly, uh, I would like to bring in, I'd like to capture uh, other species of New World rodents and bring them into the lab and test them for susceptibility to SARS-CoV-2 so we can get a, a better idea of the potential 
uh, species that might be susceptible to this virus. And this is not just in your area. I mean, deer mice are all over North America, yep. right? Yep, yep, yep. From the subarctic down to Central America. Yeah. So, so, so next is, to uh, next to bats, rodents are another species we need to be careful about for spillovers, right? Yeah, I, I think, I, yeah, I think rodents are probably more important if you look at the total number of deaths, you know, each year. There are a lot of hot or a lot of rodent-borne viruses that kill people, and uh, and I know there's some people who think bats are special. Uh, I don't think they're special. I just think they're different. Uh, but we could have another art, a discussion about that. Uh, Lin Fa and I uh, talk about this on occasion, and of course, you know, he's in the special group, and uh, I'm in the minority where I think they're just different. So, you mentioned the um, neurological involvement, and then uh, I think it was in the discussion you talk about two possible mechanisms for how that uh, how the virus is getting there. Can you just briefly discuss those? Well. Um, that would be better for my pathologists on the paper to address, but <laughs> I think one of them is that uh, the fact that it's getting into the nasal cavity and it's infecting the uh, the respiratory uh, epithelium, the nasal epithelium, where there's contact with the nervous nerve cells, right, uh, through the susenticular cells, uh, that may provide a conduit uh, through the blood brain uh, into those nerve cells and then into the trigeminal ganglia, and also, of course, uh, down the olfactory nerve, which leads directly to the olfactory bulb, right. Um, so uh, whether this is important or not, I don't know at this point, because like I said, we didn't see any neurological manifestations that we could detect. And it didn't seem like there was uh, anything that would lead to lead us to suggest to think that there might be some severe damage going on in the brains of these of these animals. Now, you can certainly, you know, trick these viruses into becoming neurotropic, right? I mean, there are mouse hepatitis viruses that uh, are neurotropic and you just have to do the right types of passaging. Um, so we could go that route, but uh, I'm not sure we want to at this point. I'd rather do other things mm -hmm. that I think are much more appealing intellectually. So you you will look at other mouse species besides deer mice, right, in the wild? That's the plan. Yeah, we have, we have you know, a few dozen different species of Chrysidid rodents in Colorado, and I already have uh, a number of places where I know they are because we have this long history of doing hauntivars surveillance in wild rodents. And so I know... If I want cotton rats, I know where to go get them in Colorado. If I want Western harvest mice, I know where to get them in Colorado. Um, so I have all this information in place. I just need the, the money to go out and get them and uh, bring them in and put them in our BSL-3. They won't be able to go into the regular mouse room. They'll have to go straight, straight to the BSL-3 where we can then uh, set them up and do those experiments. I have to tell you that a um, number of years ago, I wanted to look at viruses in our local mice here in the Northeast. So Charlie Kalisher sent me a case of his mouse traps to use because yeah. he wasn't using them anymore. Yeah. And I still have them. I had I never got to it because uh, you have to check traps many times a day yep. so the mice don't. And I'm I, I go to New York to work, so I'm you know <laughs> I didn't know yeah. how to work that out. But after like a month, Charlie said, "So how's it going?" I said, "Well, I haven't started yet." And he <laughs> said, "He said, ah, oh, you're not really interested in that." <laughs> yeah. <laughs> No, I have hundreds of traps. I have a trailer that I can connect to my, uh, hook up to my truck and we have everything we need. Uh, we just need the money to pay for the trip and the supplies and to do the work. So, you know, how did this happen, Tony? I mean, you, what a career path. You're not a vet, you're not an animal guy. And here you are doing all this stuff. Um, well, I mostly did it because I thought it was fun and it just happened to turn out to be also interesting. Uh, you know, I I tell my kids that whatever they decide to do with their lives, it, you know, it should pay a living wage and uh, you should enjoy doing it and it should have a low chance of being lost to robots or automation. And I think that fun part <laughs> is really important, right? Uh, and so uh, I've sort of had this trail where I've moved uh, around a little bit, but I've always kept my foot on zoonotic viruses and in wildlife. Uh, and I've not been all that interested in pathogenesis, I understand that's important because that's what NIH is all about. But to me, it's the biology that's the interesting thing. How does how did this coronavirus these coronaviruses evolve to be really optimized for being in their bat species? How do hauntaviruses uh, how have they evolved to be optimized in their rodents and their bats and and shrews and moles? Right. Uh, and to me, those are the cool biological questions. Uh, but of course. Uh, that's mostly purview of NSF and less so for NIH. Uh, so, you know, 
do something you like to do and, and try to make a career out of it. That's kind of my perspective. Can we talk a little and bit he, about bats, uh, Tony? Sorry, who had oh, a question? B- before that, I just wanted to have Tony talk a little about yeah. these, how these could be the intermediate host uh, for SARS-CoV-2 based on the mice that are in Asia. Yeah, so um, so there, if, if you look at, man, there are many chrysated species of rodents in Asia, uh, and many of them are found in regions where rhinolophus bats are found, right? Uh, and so for me, it's not difficult uh, because mice oftentimes are opportunist, right? If they find partially eating, eaten fruits or uh, they go into to caves that might have bats or into trees if they're arboreal rodents, uh, they could easily encounter these bats and you could get a transmission event from a bat to one of these rodents. If its ACE2 receptor is like the deer mouse, then I think that stands a good chance of a transmission event. Uh, and if that species also happens, that that species of rodent also happens to be peri-domestic, uh, then I think that could lead to a transmission event in some rural community. I, I don't, I don't think it's too much of a stretch to say that this SARS outbreak, this COVID outbreak, really probably didn't start in the Wuhan uh, 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 wet market. It probably started before that. I mean, based on the serology data, uh, where there were people who haven't even been, hadn't been to that market, uh, and from earlier time points. So. Uh, how long was this virus moving between people in China before it finally got to Wuhan? I don't, I don't know the answer to that. But I, I, I don't have a hard time seeing a, a bat virus going into a rodent and then going into a human. I think that's a, I think that's a pretty good path. I mean, with MERS, right? With uh, dromedary camels, that's a much easier path because dromedary camels are domesticated animals, right? So the virus probably spilled over into camels in North Africa and then during the camel trade where they were brought into the Middle East, that's when you started seeing uh, the transmission of the virus in those dromedary camels. Is there, is there any, uh, what are the thoughts about when that spillover of MERS into camels might have happened? Uh, I haven't looked at any data recently, but my understanding it's estimated to be in the last 50 to 100 years. Hmm. Uh, so one of my colleagues here, uh, Dick Bowen, he uh, surveilled a number of camels that are in the United States, right? Because we have a couple thousand camels uh, and they were all imported in the 1800s. Uh, and I don't think any of those camels had evidence of MERS coronavirus antibodies. So um, so that's that's my understanding is probably in the last 50 to 100 years that whatever spillover event happened uh, that led it into camels probably happened in that time frame. So the, well, most of the wildlife sampling or all of it in China for coronas is in bats, right? A little bit of pangolins recently, but nobody's I, looking in rodents, right? I, I, I don't know if they are. I would hope that Huh. You know, maybe uh, she and Peng are, are, uh, saw the papers uh, on deer mice uh, from the Canadian group and from us. And uh, maybe that is uh, sort of uh, spearheaded a, a project for them to go start surveilling hmm. rodents in, and so let me, in southern China. Let me get this straight. In the U.S., no one's looked in wild mice for coronaviruses yet. I, I've looked in. I, I looked in PubMed and I couldn't find anything. Wow. Uh, I've sent uh, emails to a couple of of, uh, of senior colleagues of mine that I think have a better chance of knowing. I, I ch- talked to Charlie Kalisher about it uh, and Kay Holmes, and they don't, uh, they're not aware of any studies on, on coronaviruses and wild rodents in, in North America. There are, of course, other coronaviruses in North America, right? The agriculturally important ones, bovine coronavirus and, uh, and some of those. But as far as wild rodents, I'm not aware of any, and uh, I don't know if there are. Sounds I mean, like there a, clearly are coronaviruses in bats in North America, right? Yeah, Alpha coronaviruses. Yeah. Sounds like a project that should be done, right? Well, I hope so. Need I hope money. The study sections agree. Yeah. All yeah. right. Well, we we agree too. Not that we matter. <laughs> and I'll put that. I'll put that in this in the statistical <laughs> significance. Yes. Right. <laughs> the TWIV group says it should be fun. Oh, I mean, all of this should be done. I mean, that's why we're in this situation. We don't know what's out there, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, so tell us about your. Uh, your bat colony. We're, you know, we're going to visit it. So in, in lieu of that, give us a picture of it. Well, uh, we have this colony of, of Jamaican fruit bats, and they're among the largest uh, bat species in North America. Uh, they're about, oh, 40 to 50 grams for an adult male. Um, right now we have a couple. Show us it, uh, oh, <laughs> they're, this they're will about, be on YouTube. They're about this size. Right? <laughs> oh, okay. okay. About this size. <laughs> no. Uh, okay. Uh, they're about 40 or 50 grams, um, you know, and uh, 
So they're they're larger than a valve sea mouse, uh, not quite as large as a as a young Syrian hamster, uh, but uh, it's kind of misleading because uh, most of that weight is body is is muscle mass. So when you open them up, they're like tiny on the inside. Their spleens are small. Their intestine is small. Their intestine's only about uh, 12 centimeters long, and they have almost no large intestine. It's almost all small intestine. That's probably because they're fruit bats, right? Um, and we've had this colony for about uh, 14 or 15 years now, and we initially started it uh, after the original SARS outbreak. Uh, we had a contract from uh, NIH with uh, Galveston, uh, and, and uh, the program officer at NIH gave us permission to start doing some bat work, and so we established a, a colony from funds from that NIH support. Uh, and we looked at a virus called Takaribe virus, which was the first arena virus discovered in North America or in, in the Americas, sorry. Uh, it wasn't the first described. The first described, uh, of course, was Machupo virus uh, in Bolivian hemorrhagic fever. Uh, and then subsequently it was shown that Takaribe was actually a, an arena virus as well. And this was a natural pathogen of these bats. And so we thought we had this great uh, model system to study it. And so we did a number of experimental infections. And this virus, just like in the wild, was it was killing uh, uh, these Jamaican fruit bats in the wild in Trinidad and Tobago. Uh, it was also, it would also kill them if they were experimentally infected. And I just want to put this out there that there are a lot of people that say bats don't get, they don't die from viruses. And that's totally not true. Uh, Takaribe is clearly a pathogen. Rabies kills them. Uh, the reason that, that I think people think that bats don't die is because they study the viruses for which they are reservoirs. And of course, almost no virus kills its reservoir. Uh, there are exceptions to that rule, but if you're going to select on reservoirs uh, viruses, then uh, all bets are off, right? Um, so we've had this colony for many years. We've done some transcriptome profiling. We've done uh, uh, some genetic profiling. They seem to only have one IgG isotype. So there's IgG, there's not an IgG one or two or three. They only seem to have a single IgG heavy chain. Uh, they have an IgA, they have uh, IgM, uh, they don't have IgD, uh, so many species don't have an IgD. Um, uh, and I should get back to the IgG, uh, different species of bats have different numbers. And so uh, little brown bats, I think, have three or four IgGs, and there's another species of bat that has five IgGs. Horses have seven IgGs, so those vary uh, between species. Um, but in terms of the virology, uh, we've done a number infect of infection studies. Uh, right now, of course, we have MERS coronavirus studies ongoing. Uh, we've worked with these, this, uh, these new influenza viruses. Are you familiar with the H17 and H18 flu viruses? Uh, and so those are really weird. Uh, we now know what the hemagglutinin does. It, instead of binding sialic acids, it binds to MAC class 2. Uh, and the neuraminidase, we still have no clue what it does. It doesn't seem to cleave sialic acids. Uh, but we're not sure what it's doing. But nonetheless, it seems to be really important uh, in bats uh, because if you passage it through them, that, that sequence is, is maintained. Um, and then, of course, we're currently uh, pursuing some SARS-CoV-2 infection studies that uh, I'll just say right now, uh, we think they're susceptible, but it's not a really robust infection. Um, and uh, I think maybe the innate immune response is really doing a good job of keeping this virus under control. Uh, and so I think it's probably a combination of a good innate immune response with uh, a virus that's not optimized to number one, a new world species of bat, and number two, a fruit bat instead of insectivorous bat like uh, the rhinolophus, those are insectivorous bats. Uh, so I think those things are conspiring uh, to prevent a, a really robust infection in those bats. Uh, how did you also, I'm sorry. Sorry. I was just wondering how you chose this particular species to establish well, the colony. It was it was mostly a matter of convenience. We had access uh, uh, to this species from a zoo, and they were willing to donate about sixty or seventy to us. And so oh, okay. We got them, uh, but it was also the fact that Takaribe virus was shown to kill them back in okay. the nineteen sixties by Will Downs' group down at the Trinidad Regional uh, Virus Lab, which was a Rockefeller funded uh, facility for many years, right? Um, and so uh, that's sort of how we got there. We had a model in place that we could start studying it, it immediately. How so, big is the colony now? Uh, well, uh, there are a few hundred bats in the colony. Uh, and uh, we used to be really picky about what we did because of the, they only produce one offspring every six months. Uh, and so that requires a, a very significant commitment to your uh, animal husbandry plan. Uh, and we've managed the colony quite well. And so we're now at a point where we don't really think twice about starting a new experiment. Uh, if we need 20 or 25 bats to do a pilot study, then we'll use them. 
Do they have their so own I know vir- that they're big. Oh, sorry. It's okay. <laughs> Go ahead, Vincent. Do they have their own virome? Have you looked at it? Well, we, in our transcriptome data, of course, we find lots of retroviral elements. Uh, we're not sure if those are endogenous retroviruses, uh, but I suspect that if there were viruses uh, in these bats, uh, they've all been either gone away or they've been cleared, uh, mostly because they've been closed for so long. And this is another reason, uh, Kathy, why you don't want to introduce new animals from the wild because of the potential of introducing new uh, infectious agents. And so. Uh, we're, we're completing a study on their uh, microbiome uh, mm-hmm. right now, uh, but of course the concern there is that uh, our bats don't get a diet that they naturally get in the wild. These are fig, uh, fig generalists, uh, so they prefer figs over everything else. Uh, and of course, we don't have the money to feed them figs because they're quite expensive. Uh, <laughs> and so they get things like bananas and uh, apples and cantaloupe and uh, other non-citrus fruits. Um, so I know that in some of the other parts of the bat literature, there's discussion of changes in type one interferon um, being on frequently or loss of certain pattern recognition receptor genes. Um, is that true in your Jamaican fruit bats? Is that true kind of across bats or is that yeah. just in certain well, bat species? Well, I, I think that yes and no is the answer and it depends on what you're looking at. So when the, the initial paper came out on the, the interferon alpha locus in uh, teropus bats that Lenfoss group showed. They had this contraction of the type 1 interferon locus, uh, but constitutive expression of type 1 interferon. Uh, and then a few, just a, a, several years after that, uh, another group uh, published a paper. This was out of Boston and Galveston uh, on uh, the Egyptian fruit bat, and they showed that there wasn't this constitutive uh, expression of interferon. So I think it just depends on the bat, right? Um, and, and I think this gets in, this becomes important to these viruses because each virus gets in its host and it has to adapt to whatever the steady state parameters are of that particular species. Uh, and so I think these, these bats shape the viruses more than the viruses shape the bats. That's my opinion. And that's why I don't think they're special. I think they're just different, right? Now we've looked at, for example, sting, which has this uh, uh, amino acid that's missing that all other mammals seem to have. And Excellent, bats, my favorite protein. <laughs> and, so it's not IL twenty one. Okay, so um, oh, that was that was grad school. Now I okay. do sting. <laughs> yeah. Um, so uh, we see the same pattern that is, is present in other bats. Uh, there's a locus called the pi hen locus, which is uh, thought to be involved in DNA sensing, and that's missing in our bats as well. So. I think that there are some of these loci that are going to be missing, gone, uh, and others that are just going to be different depending on the species that you look at. So you got to keep in mind that that's emerged very, very early in mammalian history, right? About 80 million years ago. And so they've been on an independent evolutionary trajectory ever since then. And so it's not surprising to me that they're going to be quite different in some respects because they've been, uh, you know, reproductively isolated from other mammals for such a long period of time. And in fact, we didn't really see a huge number of bat species until after the KT extinction event, right? When the dinosaurs, you know, this comet hit the Yucatan uh, and then that knocked down most of the dinosaurs and that allowed the rise of the mammals. And that's when you start seeing a huge diversification of bats along with a lot of other mammalian species as well. So there's clearly gonna be a lot of differences, right? Uh, but I think there's also going to be many similarities between these bats. So there's been some talk that um, flight and the, the the need to deal with oxidative stress and damage has shaped the bat immune system. And um, I wonder, I assume your bats can't really fly. They're in little cages. You don't give them. Nope. <laughs> Our bats are in a flight room. They So the only time we cage them is if we put them in uh, with a virus uh, uh-huh. in the BSL-3. And we're working on getting some flight cages for the BSL-3 because this is a really important Mm. point that you bring up, Vincent. Uh, If we put a bat in a cage for two weeks, that's not how bats normally do things. Mm. And you're changing their physiology again. It gets back to the problem with all animal studies in the laboratory. You're changing their actual environment. And you got to be careful in your analysis because... You know, there's one thing worse than not knowing the answer to a question, and that's being misled about the answer to a question, because then it sends you down this path that's going to lead you further and further away from the truth. And you spend money and time at the, on it, and it's, it's a waste of your effort. So you have to be very careful about that. And so this is a very important point that we need to do 
flight cages for infection mm. studies, and we're getting there. We're just not quite there yet. How big is How a, big flight, is a cage? flight cage? <laughs> so it's it's big enough that we can walk into them, right? Uh, so uh, I have to kind of duck my head as I go in, but it's mostly mesh netting on the sides. Mm -hmm. uh, we have one of these right now. We're going to get some others uh, in our new building. We have a new building that's coming up. We're moving into it next month. It's got three dedicated back rooms. Uh, so we can do concurrent experiment bat infection experiments in this new facility. Uh, by the way, it's called the uh, Center for Vector Borne Infectious Diseases, CVID. And I think we need to put an O, Center O, so we can turn it into COVID. <laughs> yeah. I don't, nobody else wants that. Um, so these cages are big enough that we can walk in and it gives the bats uh, a, yeah. about probably uh, six meters or five meters of, of flight distance that they can do at a time. Uh, and so it's not like long-term flight like they do where they're going to build up their body temperature, which is, I think, is what Vincent was was mm -hmm. getting to. Um, but nonetheless, um, uh, that's the best we can do because we don't have a big facility where we can let them fly. So do they do they fly around in this thing? Or yep. Take yep. advantage of yep. it? Yeah. Oh, I so yeah. wish we could have visited, you know, maybe next time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, whenever you're in Fort Collins, any one of you in Fort Collins, just let me know. Give me a heads up and I'll give you a tour. I also noticed you you published a paper that these bats, your your Jamaican fruit bats, can be infected with MERS coronavirus as well. Right? Yes, yes, yes. So so, so they get a, a mild infection, uh, and uh, in fact, we have a grant. Susan Weiss is the PI on that grant, mm -hmm. uh, and we're doing some uh, uh, we're using some uh, mutated viruses to look at the effects of certain viral genes on infection in the, in the bats. So that kind of but again, supports the idea that. To bat it went from bats to camels to humans, right? Yeah, I think that's a really compelling argument, mm. uh, along with the fact that there are a lot of MERS-like coronavirus sequences found in a number of bat yeah. species. All right, Tony. Uh, I just want to else, point please? out to the listeners that Vincent also put in our uh, reading materials this uh, frontiers. It's sort of a review article about. Uh, to me, I just always say, "Why bats?" You know, what's yeah. what's uh, not special, but uh, different. Is that how different. you put it? That's the different. word I like. It's, What's different. different about bats? Um, and it, it was a, it's a nice kind of review of the various things, the fever idea, of flight yeah. is fever and, and so forth. So Yeah, uh, I, I'm not a big fan of that because by the time fever starts, the immune response is already going. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. and, and flying is not the same as a fever response. You're, you're generating heat from flying because you're burning ATP. You're generating fever from an immune response because IL-1 and TNF have been made and you've got prostaglandin synthesis and it's telling the hypothalamus that it's time to elevate the body temperature. And by the time that occurs, your immune system is already in the battle. And so I'm not a big fan of the flight is fever hypothesis. There have been a lot of these uh, ideas put out by uh, certain bat biology people and uh, virologists, uh, but none of them have ever done any experimental work to show it. So it's all... Yeah, uh, speculation at this that, point. That's why I think I like this review. Is it? It kind of goes through that, and you have a nice hypothesis and and model yeah. for how yeah. things are how things are so, different. So, Tony, is it even true that bats are a particularly uh, robust s a reservoir, or are we just fix fixated on them? I, and it's where we're looking. I, you know, uh, there there were a couple of papers that came out several years ago that suggested bats harbor a disproportionate number of viruses and somehow that got morphed into zoonotic viruses and that's not the same right mm -hmm. you can have lots of viruses but they're not zoonotic unless they can spill over right um and then most recently i think uh, last summer there was a paper in pnas that suggested no they're just about the same as other mm -hmm. mammalian species in terms of their uh, virus richness and so uh, you know i what are there like uh, maybe 12 or 15 really infamous bat viruses. You can name them on three hands. And I could, there, there are that many hantaviruses that come from rodents. And I'm just looking at one genera, mm -hmm. right, of hantaviruses. So uh, there are about 2,200 species of rod rodents and about 1,200 or 1,300 species of bats. And so together, that's two thirds of all mammalian species. Uh, I think they're both really important. Uh, but if you look in terms of uh, disease burden each year, uh, I don't know. I think that the rodent-borne viruses are right near the top. I mean, there are a couple hundred thousand hantavirus cases every year from rodent-born hantaviruses. Wasn't it um, Lin Fa Wang last year at ASV in Minneapolis, right? He got up and he said he and Peter Dashak had this argument 
Yeah. You know, Dash X said bats special. are not special, yeah. and Linfa said they were. Is that right? How it went? Yes. Yeah. And yes. Linfa said he won the argument, but, but yes, you, but Peter capitulated. He's a traitor. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I got it. Good. Um, uh, so, switched, switched teams. I want to know one more thing. Uh, you have this great bat colony. Are there others in the U.S. Uh, or are they pretty rare? They're pretty rare. Yeah. Um, I know that there are a few other colonies. Uh, of course, CDC has an Egyptian fruit bat colony. Uh, they maintain that in their BSL-3 facility because they had some import issues they had to deal with because mm. it's a reservoir of Marburg. Um, and their animal committee required that as mm. well as their biosafety. Um, uh, but other than ours, uh, there aren't that many out there. We're trying to get some bats to some other, uh, another place that we can establish another colony. Uh, because my concern is that somebody goes into our our facility and they happen to have some infection, for example, SARS, uh, and they transmit it to our bats and, and it kills them. And then that way the, the resource mm. is gone. And so I think it's dangerous having uh, just a single uh, colony. So I think we need to have some replicates of these bats. But um, uh, other than that, there really aren't any. Uh, and we, we have, a, a at least for infectious disease work, uh, and there's clearly a big demand for it. Uh, and I think that in the future, I'm optimistic that that might change. We're already providing as a service to other investigators some infection work for them, so we can do up to BSL-3 here at Colorado State. Uh, we're hoping to do some BSL-4 work with uh, Vincent Munster at RML, uh, but of course they're kind of inundated right now with SARS work, uh, COVID work, uh, and so all that work is put on hold right now. But I think in the future we're going to start to see some more exciting mm -hmm. things happening in bad infectious disease research with these closed colonies. And and what is the bat baseball thing you meant to tell us? Oh, so <laughs> so Rich, you 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 remember the Pingree Park meeting, right? Oh yeah. So this was back uh, in uh, 2006, I think, uh, just after the two papers, you know, one from Linfaw's group and the other from Patrick Wu and uh, uh, KY and uh, uh, Susanna Lau at Hong Kong University. They came out and showed that. Uh, SARS-CoV like viruses were found in bats and that probably this is the source of SARS-CoV. Uh, and so we were at that uh, meeting at the Pingree Park campus, which is a three day weekend. In the evening, we drink lots of beer and other things. Uh, and Charlie Callisher approached me uh, and asked me what I knew about bats. And I thought he was asking me a baseball question. <laughs> and I said, well, most of them are made out of ash, but some are made out of maple. Uh, and he goes, not, not bats bats and i said i don't know anything about bats and he said well we should write a review article and it's like you have to have a publication record before you can write a review article and he said nobody's done this so we can do it and huh. we got that paper in clinical micro reviews uh and it's been cited hundreds of times and, and it's the only review article i've ever written where i had no publications in the field it's, it's just crazy but uh Anyway, that's how I got started in bats, and that's what led us down this path of uh, uh, doing experimental infections because we had the uh, the sort of the resources and facilities available, and, and we didn't know not to say no, and so we just jumped mm -hmm. right in, and here we are. Yeah, that review is is known to be the first where it put together this idea that bats, all together. viruses and bats could be a problem, yeah. yeah. But, but you would say rodents also. I, I think rodents clearly are important. I yeah. think the bats get a, a, a lot of attention because these are really glamorous viruses. They do really, really bad things, yeah. right? Yeah. And and I get that. Um, so before SARS-2, I think rodents were clearly more important. But now we've got, you know what, a million deaths globally uh, from this bat virus. So maybe this is what gives it the edge right now. But, uh, Tony, I think rodents are still important. Why uh, are they called deer mice, by the way? Uh, that's a good question. You know, in the old literature, it's actually deer mouse is a one word, and some people still use it as, as deer mouse. Uh, and I would guess it's because their coat color looks very similar to what you would see in a deer. So they're kind of tan, golden tan to, to a sort of a light brown on top, and then they have a white belly. Uh, the only thing they're missing are the antlers. Uh, so perhaps that's uh, the foundation of, of, of Got that it. Uh, naming. All right. Tony Shounce. Colorado State University. Thanks so much for joining us, Tony. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Loved it. I hope to see you someday in person. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, Tony. Bye -bye. Thanks. Okay. I learned Thanks, a lot. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. See ya. You know, um, <laughs> there is still classic virology going on. Yeah, every, every this is great. Week.
Mm-hmm. I, I have to and say, he clearly you know, is passionate about the field work, which is great. The, you know, uh, he loves it. The paper we did from Barrick's lab last week, you know, I thought that was just classic virology and this too. So it still exists. <clears throat> I don't know um, if you saw, but I wrote you all a letter about the Varick paper. <laughs> yeah, we'll we'll um we'll get to maybe we'll do that on Friday. Okay, I saw that. Sounds good. I didn't, didn't have a chance to put it on yet. All right. Um, now Kathy had sent me a, an email from a friend of yours, right, about a follow up to TWIV six six six, and she it was I seem to recall something like the inverse square law that as you move away from the radiation source the intensity drops square of the distance to follow the thought process a bunch of lights on the ceiling of a 10 foot high coffee shop would give you only one hundredth the power as at the source it reminds me of radio isotope training where distance was always one if the precautions you take am I correct my sense is that it's not going to be that much of a game changer in a movie theater or gym so I asked David and he responded, in answer, she, he is quite right that light intensity decreases as the square of the distance from the source, at least from a point source. The idea here is to design the lighting in the room in question so that far UVC dose level at about 1.9 meters above floor level is at or below the regulatory far UVC threshold limit value for far UVC light, technically about 3 MJ microjoules, millijoules per centimeter square per eight hours. This is achieved by standard visible lighting design software with minor modification for differences in the light scattering. So that I interpret to mean that you can deal with it, right? Just use powerful lights that yeah, don't, yeah. don't fry everything. So the listener's question is uh, on the mark and they <clears throat> have got it under control. And then he wrote, incidentally, I think people from the ionizing radiation world – are uncomfortable with the use of the term inactivation in the current contact. This is so vague and could refer to anything. The accurate term for what you're trying to achieve is reproductive death. No, these are viruses. Inactivation is absolutely correct, right? <laughs> <laughs> reproductive death yeah, is it's not. It's the clash of two different yeah. uh, nomenclatures. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, reproductive death, I, I, yeah. That's something we it use. It kind in of biology, does describe right? it, but from from our standpoint, we talk about virus inactivation. Yeah, so. yeah, that's yeah. It's just the, the language of the field. That's right. All right, Kathy, um, you had a follow up. <laughs> yeah, I did. Um, uh, on the episode that was released Sunday, you recorded last Friday, so that would be six sixty seven, which, by the way, would be two thirds of the way to one thousand. Um, uh, Vincent, um, made a mistake and before 10 to the 11th listeners write in, I want <laughs> to say that he meant to say that 10 to the 11th is one followed by 11 zeros. That's all. What was that in reference to? I forgot. Um, adenovirus dose oh, in the dose one of the they're vaccines. Giving, uh, yeah. 10 to the 11th particles, right? Okay. Uh, Brianne, can you take that first email? Sure. Adriana and Liam Wright. Dear TWIV team, we are researchers at the University of Melbourne studying inf- antimicrobial resistance in hospital pathogens and have greatly enjoyed listening to you in the lab over the past few months. Your podcasts make experiments involving a lot of repetitive pipetting far more enjoyable. We have recently experienced a second wave here in moderately sunny 16 degrees C, C Melbourne. But an extremely strict lockdown has brought COVID-19 cases down relatively quickly, from 750 a day to 20 a day in five weeks. We are not virologists or immunologists by trade, but both agree we have learned a great deal from listening to TWIV. In previous episodes, you have stated that people with low viral loads are less likely to transmit SARS-CoV-2 from person to person, an assumption that forms the basis of the MINA testing plan. You have also discussed that based on observations of reinfection by SARS-CoV-2, and given what we know about immunity to seasonal coronaviruses, a vaccine against SARS-CoV-2 seems likely to provide protective rather than sterilizing immunity, which may mean that vaccinated individuals can still spread the virus. The implications of this scenario are important, as such a vaccine may not protect people who can't or won't be immunized or groups for which the vaccine is not efficacious. Our questions are, with what certainty can you state a non-sterilizing vaccine will not reduce spread? 
Is there evidence that other protect protective vaccines reduce viral load and therefore transmission rates? Could such a vaccine help reduce the frequency of super spreader events? Could a protective vaccine administered through an, to enough of the population lower the r naught and help manage the pandemic? Thanks so much for TWIV. We have become evangelists for your podcast and will continue to recommend it far and wide. All the best, Adriana and Liam. Um, and Adriana is a PhD student um, in a lab in Australia. Um, so they have a lot of questions here. Um, and I think that um, one piece to all of this is that um, we, she asks, with what certainty can we say that a non-sterilizing vaccine will not reduce spread? Um, and sometimes I think people are imagining that this vaccine will reduce viral load and that's why there won't be symptoms. But instead, um, we're not necessarily saying that it will reduce viral load. We are saying that it will allow for an immune response that will make sure that that virus doesn't cause disease. Um, and so there may mm. not, we'll see from the trials, be a difference in viral load. We don't know. Yeah, we don't know. This is a new, well, new, but the theory is that if it's not sterilizing, it may not reduce spread. I would say for the evidence that other protective vaccines, so I always go back to the Sabin inact, um, the Salk inactivated polio vaccine, which is injected in your muscle, right? Protects you against paralytic disease, but your gut remains susceptible to infection. You can get infected, spread the virus to other people. And in fact, it can immunize them as well. So there's an example where it does not impact transmission. It may- so, so it Am I correct in the way you just explained that in saying that basically the immune response keeps the virus from leaving the gut and going to other tissues? Yeah, probably the in the blood once the virus gets into the blood, it's neutralized, right? In some way. Yes. Yes. That's correct. Uh, so a lot of the new listeners may not understand the uh how polio ordinarily works. What? It's ordinarily yeah, I know, <laughs> but you know, these are new listeners. I'm just kidding. I know. <laughs> That it's uh, only a uh, minor fraction of those who get infected that get paralytic disease because the virus goes off its normal course into the normal nervous system and the normal course is a GI dis uh, disease, right? Yeah. AKA summer diarrhea. Well, right. actually there's, there's, there's very little uh, GI <laughs> symptomatology with polio. Um, but that's where the virus, that's where in, in everyone who gets infected, it reproduces there. And then in 1%, the virus gets into the CNS. Yeah. But um, I, there, there's certainly others. And um, it's, you know, that's the theory, right? Super spreaders. Could it reduce? I suppose it might, right? Depends on what it does. We just don't right. know. We're, we're, I think a lot of these questions assume that the vaccine is reducing viral load. Yeah. Um, and we don't know if that's the case. I think we draw our speculations from the common cold coronaviruses, right? Where we see uh, repeated infections and transmission clearly is happening in a highly immune population, right? So you must still have enough shedding to get transmission, even if you have been infected before. That's where we're you know, drawing these uh, hypotheses from, but what? Yeah, happens? and I don't think we've really put a. I mean, these questions are about basically how much viral load under different circumstances and or and different states of immunity. And we don't even in the case of the common cold coronaviruses, we don't have answers to that. Okay, because most of the population, most of the adult population, is immune, so you can't do the comparison between a naive individual getting infected with a common cold coronavirus and and an immune individual. And I don't even know whether my guess is the studies don't even exist looking at viral load in naive children versus people who get mm. reinfected with no. a common cold coronavirus. So these are all good. things that uh, remain to be discovered. That would be a good experiment to do, yeah, because as the kids get their <laughs> first infection, how much do they shed? Well, we know for SARS-CoV-2 that kids who get infected shed sometimes more than adults. Right. So it wouldn't surprise me at all if and this is pure speculation, but it wouldn't surprise me at all if a vaccine 
would actually reduce the virus load on average, okay, and reduce some of the spread and reduce the R naught, okay, uh, but it remains to be seen. Yep. Yep. These we will revisit these when we have data from the vaccines, which is going to be some time, right? Okay, uh, Rich, can you take the next one? Uh, I worked on this. I thought I'm, you would. This is your thing. I'm glad. I'm glad I worked on it because getting the uh, uh, getting the rhythm down is a challenge. This is a limerick. He says, "I don't think I broke any rules." From Charles, informed Trump knew the truth. Deadly virus, miracle hope from a dope lied to us. We must now remove the dolt. So get out and go vote. Do it now. No delay. Protect us. And he adds a quote from Senior, uh, Senator Daniel Patrick Moynihan. You are entitled to your opinion, but you are not entitled to your own facts. So that's the source of that quote. I use that all the yeah. time. Huh. I didn't that's know a, that. That's a, we, we probably need to fact check that. <laughs> as the source, but, um, and I will do so. Uh, but uh, uh, that is a great quote. Twiv arcs. I am just a computer programmer. 53 Fahrenheit 12C in Chapel Hill. Uh, great walk at Brumley Forest. Looks like the media needs a lesson about the difference between CFR and IFR. That's case fatality rate and infection fatality rate. On TWIV665, it sounded like Rachel Maddow or her guest got it wrong. They were uh, looking, they were projecting 6 million deaths in the U.S., I think. About a week ago, Philip Bump at the Washington Post got it wrong. He links to Pump, uh, Pump's, uh, Bump's article. Uh, the, um, I am not an epidemiologist which means that I am about as qualified as Scott Atlas, <laughs> Trump's new BFF for all things COVID-19, to calculate how many deaths will be caused by going for herd immunity. I would like for the Twibbers to judge if I got it right. Here goes. My, first, my assumptions. U.S. populations, 328,239,523. Infection fatality rate, 0.68% and 91% infection rate. My math is simple. Uh, the population times the infection fatality rate times the infection rate equates to 2 million through 31,146 deaths. I don't think anybody will argue with the population. Some may argue with the infection fatality rate, but not by much. The infection rate could be a problem. I don't think that herd immunity works uh, for a virus that we do not develop a durable immunity. From listening to TWIB665, if I understood correctly, you agree that herd immunity for SARS-CoV-2 is not the correct measure. Going for the lowest infection rate of the common cold coronavirus, it seems like a better estimate. Did I get it right? And he gives links for his assumptions. Thanks, Charles. Well, Charles, I get basically the same thing. I do this. I go through the same process. Uh, and, I, uh, you know, to me, the as you point out, the, the big unknowns are the infection fatality rate, which I've seen estimated between. And these have to be estimates because we don't actually know what it is. There's not enough testing. Uh, but that's uh, between 0.5 percent, 0.1 percent, the estimates that I've seen. So 0.68 is right in the middle. So that's fine. Uh, 91 percent infection rate, you know, for herd immunity. I've seen estimates uh, between 70 percent and uh, 90 percent. The uh, seropositivity for the common cold coronaviruses in the adult population is up around 90%. So that's a perfectly reasonable number. Uh, and the math, of, of course, is straightforward. The number that I've come up with doing this several times is in the U.S. between 1.3 and 2.6 million. So uh, you're uh, right in there. So I agree with uh, what you're talking about. Yeah. I think that's correct. I think, as we said, Rachel Maddow was looking at CFR, not IFR. And that's a big number. Yeah. Okay? We just crossed 200,000. So if you let this go with no, uh, with no vaccine, I was going to say no intervention, but even if 
the way I see it, even if you do all the mitigations that we have, all that does is stretch out the timeline. Not that that's a bad thing. That's a good thing. It buys you time. But I think the only way to we're talking about ultimately establishing some level of immunity in the population that will tamp this down to, uh, you know, not be a problem. And that the only I only see two ways of doing that. One is uh, natural immunity and the other is a vaccine. And if it's natural immunity, you're talking a lot of people dying ultimately. And you're talking, you know, a long period of time. We're only at only at 200,000 dead at this point. We're talking about if these numbers are correct and they're perfectly reasonable, uh, six times that at least. Okay. I, I don't see how anyone can argue that we just let it go. It just doesn't make any sense. No. If you no, care about doesn't people, make any sense. If you care about people, you would never say that. I, I don't. You get control it. it as best you can while you develop. This is this is the new iteration of flatten the curve, right? Yeah. You do whatever mitigation you can to control it as best you can, so that we can live lives that are as close to normal as possible while we get together the technology, specifically the vaccine, to actually bring it under control. So what's happening here is that this, you know, people like Scott Atlas, they know what the science is, but they don't want to agree with it because they're making a political issue of it to divide the population to the people who think it's a problem and the people who think it's it's not. And that's just crazy because the science doesn't take sides. And it's it's just the wrong thing to do, Scott. By the way, did you guys hear that letter that Stanford professors wrote, he threatened to sue them. He made them take it down. Can you believe yeah, I that? that? I didn't know that. Yeah. I thought I sue them for Amendment, what? Is the first question. Amendment yeah. creeps in there somewhere, yeah. right? Well, the First Amendment is a government thing, as Alan says. It's if one professor versus another, there's no First Amendment involved there. <laughs> so I don't know how you could. Yeah, what would you sue for? Defamation? They're saying the facts. He says, "Don't wear masks," and that's the wrong thing to say. Come on. Uh, anyway, there is a place where you can still find that letter. By the way, Twiv listeners, <laughs> a uh, a big issue with the uh, politics is uh, pandering to individuals or speaking to individuals who want to keep the economy going. <clears throat> OK, and uh, there there's no question that under the best of circumstances, yeah, that's probably uh, another, some yeah. some businesses are going to suffer. Of course. All right. Of but course. you have to you have to weigh that against the uh, the human toll in public health. Yeah. And I think that we're learning enough about this so that a path, what I've called a middle way, can be forged uh, to uh, minimize both the health consequences and the economic mm. damage. Uh, but people want to have it all or nothing. Yeah. Uh, and, and it's just not that way. If you wear masks, if you keep your distance, if you practice uh, hygiene, you really can have an effect. And you can still have your grocery store open. Okay? Uh, there's a lot of businesses that can survive under these circumstances. Some are going to be hurt. Okay? But, you know... Does your plan also include uh, testing? Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Left that one out. Absolutely. Yes, testing. Yeah. Testing is a big yeah. I, I To me, it's it, until we get a handle on all of those things, the economy is still going to suffer mm -hmm. because we're just not going to make the progress that we need to make. And, and I think that we should not discount the fact that 2 million deaths is also not good for the economy. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I have one more Scott Atlas story. I was on a call last weekend with um, Shane Crotty and others. And Shane said that there was a press conference the previous week where Atlas held up his cell paper showing the cross-reactive T-cell epitopes um, among common cold coronaviruses and uh, SARS-CoV-2. And so Atlas said, okay, in New York City, we have 20% seropositivity, and half of the population has cross-reactive antibodies. We're at 70% herd immunity. We're there. We don't have to do anything anymore. Can you believe he said this? And, and the thing is, he knows it's wrong. 
I'm convinced he knows it's wrong. He's just pandering to what his party says to do. It's just incredible. Or maybe he doesn't know it's wrong. He's a neuroscientist. <laughs> I would think he does. Whew. Anyway. Our listeners know it's wrong. They do, but they're not the whole population, sadly. Uh, Kathy, can you take this next one? That would be anonymous. You're, you're muted, oh, Dr. You're Spindler. Muted. Sorry. Uh, anonymous <laughs> writes, legal right-wing nut job pseudo-virology. The key to exposing these things is the fact that they pick a narrative and select the supporting evidence to proffer. This reminds me of the HIV stuff that came out in the late 90s. I can't recall the name, but there was a publication from England geared at HIV health and a Greek woman virologist, Papadopoulos or something like that, writing up in articles, writing up articles in this pontificating this garbage to allege that Luc Montagnier and Gallo and all the HIV research virologists were building everything based on a house of cards and the DNA chain terminators, nucleoside analogs, were iatrogenic and the cause of AIDS. It went deep and was deceptive. I lost a friend that embraced this, as did the publisher, I'm sure. Thank you for breaking this down. It's almost like you don't want to give it oxygen, but it needs to have sunlight shown upon it so that the filth can be seen floating about. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I wanted to say something. What did we just talk about? Oh, oh. Uh, we we did a we did a we had a big run on Scott Atlas. Oh, Is that it? <laughs> it? It's it's like tickling. and this was the. This was the takedown of the the yeah, a person who came from Hong Kong to the United States and did her yeah yeah thing that yeah. we called a document. <laughs> yeah. Listen, I have to tell you something. I got a paper to review for PNAS, which is basically the same thing as that document. I cannot Ooh. believe they're reviewing it. It's the same garbage. Mm. I'm so furious that I had to waste my time. So, so that must have there must be a contributor, right? I don't want to no, say. No, you who can do the for. other track, right? Well, oh, you don't need a sponsor anymore. No, okay. I don't. I didn't know, but you know, editors decide whether to s send something to, for review or not, and it should not have happened. I'm not going to say who the editor was, but man, this is very sad. What was I going to tell you guys about? So we were talking about Scott Atlas. And Shane Crotty, uh, it's, maybe it'll come back. It'll uh, come back. <laughs> You're very confident. <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, this is from Kim. Thank you, Twiv, for providing me a scientific escape a few times a week for the reality show type news cycle. <laughs> I discovered your podcast <laughs> on long drives this summer to camp, hike, mountain bike, or paddleboard somewhere high and beautiful. I'm loving the outdoors, sun and warm weather this fall and dreading the coming cold days ahead. I've been waiting months for more thoughtful discussion on creating safe indoor environments with SARS-CoV-2 floating around. I, re I read University of Colorado Boulder worked through the summer to adjust air intake dampers for their campus buildings, HVAC systems, to incorporate 80% outdoor air, which increases heating and cooling costs. Hard to tell if it is helping because the kids continue to party and forced to shut down by the university for two weeks for all virtual instruction with the rapid increase in cases. Great. But I really enjoyed your episode 666 discussing far UVC light. I've looked for literature on inserting UV lights into HVAC systems but didn't find much. I'd love to see someone study these lights and return air ducts to HVAC systems. I wonder if the spike in cases in the southern states was due to hot and humid conditions, letting the virus spread with air conditioning or if it truly is close immediate respiratory drop con droplet contact. I'd also like to see if anyone is studying elderly care center outbreaks and what kind of H HVAC systems they had. I would imagine forced air systems could be worse than radiant floor or boiler radiator systems. I think those are good questions. I don't know. And there are plenty of these elderly care center outbreaks. You know, that's one of the main uh, super spreader events. But I don't know that they study the air handling system. That's a good question. K Kathy's uh, pick of the week speaks to this okay. in a way. Yeah. Inserting UVC lights in elevators should be a great first step. I think I saw an airborne study of another virus in Korea or China, and it stayed largely on one floor, but did show some leak through the elevator shaft. 
I prefer the free workout equipment in the stairwell at the hospital where I work, but climbing six flights in a mask tends to create moisture and still allow just one mask per shift. I know your shows have said fomite transmission is quite minimal in contact tracing. I wonder if that's because the amount of virus picked up and inhaled is well below the threshold infectious dose, or if the virus just doesn't survive long on surfaces contrary to earlier surface testing studies. I'm wondering if you think that might shift a bit during winter months. There were quite a few studies on how long the virus was active in different temperatures and humidity. You freeze the virus for research storage, so isn't it possible fomite transmission might be more problematic during freezing temperatures and shorter daylight days? I won't sanitize my groceries, but will probably be more cautious touching public items. In fact, I'm not buying a ski pass this season. I bought a split board and will get a free workout skinning up the mountain and snowboard down away from others. I have no idea what that means. I don't know what a split board is. I can tell you. I can tell you. I skied on February 29th, the day Colorado's first diagnosed case flew into Denver and became positive in Summit County a few days later. I remember not wanting to touch the bar on the lift while I avoided the lodge and the crowded shuttle bus. Thanks again for the deep dives into science and current events. And Kim is a hospital pharmacist in Colorado. Um, I I think, uh, listen, I am still very careful when I touch door handles and so forth, not to touch myself afterwards. But I suspect that I think virus will remain remain infectious for long periods, a day or so on surfaces, but I don't think there's enough unless you really take a big piece of mucus and deposit it on the door handle. And I just don't think that happens. So I think the amount of virus that you get on your hands and, and put on surfaces like that is just minimal, uh, at least adult places. A kids might be a different story, toys and so forth. But um, I just think it's easy to be careful. Like when I go home at night, I go to the garage to get my car at Columbia and I open a bunch of doors and I make sure I don't touch my face until I get home and wash my hands. I'm very conscious of that. And I think that, that really helps a lot. We carry hand sanitizer in the car. Yeah, hand sanitizer so is great. So if we ever exit, uh, you know, we're uh, if on the rare occasions that we go shopping or we're out in public, when we get back in the car, that's the first thing that happens is some hand sanitizer. And still, as you say, wash your hands thoroughly when you get home. Yep. And I would remind Kim that some of the um, studies that she mentioned um, were looking at how long um, viral nucleic acid was present on surfaces. Um, and they didn't go back and look for um, virus that was infectious that could, you know, cause a plaque or something like that. Um, And so I think there are still some questions about what's going on with those services. Kim, maybe a he and Rich will tell us now about split boards. Uh, It's just uh, basically it doubles as a snowboard and short skis. Mm. It's a snowboard that splits down, uh, splits down the long axis. Okay. And can be used as short skis. So in particular, uh, the way Kim is talking about it, one could uh, sort of tread uh, uphill on the uh, skis. Oh, it's almost uh, in yeah. that circumstance, almost like uh, snowshoes. But you can also use them as short skis. But then put it together and snowboard down. Sounds like Kim is uh, quite the outdoors person, which is it's great. great. I remember you had your you had your <clears throat> arm in a cast once when you visited me, Rich, because you broke it uh-huh. skiing or something like that. Right? It was my. Uh, Collarbone, Collarbone, yeah. Which I, I uh, <laughs> so I ski on an irregular basis. And uh, on this particular occasion, I had about four or five days when I was going to be uh, without other family around. I don't like, I've always been interested in snowboarding. Okay. But if we're, you know, for, uh, we've got a limited, like a week with the whole family together, I'm not going to spend the whole week trying to snowboard while everybody else is successfully skiing and I could be with them. But I had about a week and I decided that I was going to conquer this, uh, activity. And so on about my fourth day of really intensive lessons, uh, which turned me absolutely black and blue, unbelievable. I had a mishap where I, uh, on my snowboard, went off the trail and through some trees. And I uh, I am now a poster child for wear a helmet because I'm not sure I'd be here because uh, uh, it knocked me out. <laughs> I woke up and looked up and saw this guy standing over me 
with a patch on his jacket that said Mount Bachelor. And I thought, Mount Bachelor? That's like in Oregon. The heck am I doing in Oregon? Right. And uh, it took me, uh, I got a free ride down the mountain in one of those little baskets. Okay. And it took me all that time to sort of reassemble my consciousness and figure out what was going on. So that's going to have to be another lifetime before I'm a snowboarder. All right. Uh, Brianne, can you take the next one? Sure. Katie writes, thanks for your podcast. I have been enjoying your interviews and discussions immensely, but I, I enjoyed episode 666 today and thought we should put these everywhere. This is until I thought of the microbiome. What would happen to the microbiome on our skin? Based on the article below, it might cause some issues, but it seems that it might be the lesser of two evils. Though maybe when, if the virus is more under control, we might use them more sparingly. This would be especially important for employees in businesses or areas that would utilize the lights. Thanks again for your thoughtful scientific discussions. Off to buy some goggles to wear for when our campus moves to -to face-to-face next week. Fingers crossed that our students will behave since there is no testing plan. Cheers, Mm. Katie. I don't like to hear that there's no testing plan. Um, And I hadn't really thought about the microbiome. I think that's a great question. I think you're going to be in the UVC transiently, right? You're not going to, if you're in an elevator, you're going to be in for a minute or two. So I don't think that's going to have an issue. And, and, you know, David said he has his mice five days a week. uh, (laughs) And they seem to be okay. So, but I think that we're going to be transiently in it. So uh, I'm not worried about it. Right. All right. I want us to move to our picks to right now because I don't want to miss my next meeting. And um, uh, we could easily chat long periods of time on the rest of these emails. So, picks of the week. Looks like Brienne has a pick. I do. Um, so, I know that we all are spending a lot of time with our masks still, um, and we think of many reasons why masks are important. Um, And I have a whole bunch of uh, virus masks um, with different patterns. Uh, The one that I linked is actually the image that was used for the show notes, or for the show image for Mm -hmm. a while Mm -hmm. earlier in this pandemic. Um, And if you scroll down um, this same Um, person with this shop has a whole bunch of different types of uh, virus masks, um, many of which I have and wear. Um, So I thought that our listeners might get a kick out of um, wearing virus masks. I will also tell them that if they, uh, like me, sometimes suffer from having masks that are way too big for their face, um, these masks are actually a more appropriate size. Oh, yeah, yeah, the, one of the, these uh, images is an image you used to use on the show, Vincent, yes, I think. Yes, yes. Yeah. It's by Michelle Banks, uh, Artologica, right. who uh, has made a lot of these images of microbes and viruses <laughs> and who was on TWIV some time ago. 352, cool. Science Art with Michelle Banks. Yeah, it was very cool. And for those who went to the University of Maryland, she was one of the four sci art exhibitors that came. Yes, I had quite a few things from her before this happened, before this, um, and now I have been excited to add the masks nice. to my collection. Kathy, what do you have for us? I picked uh, something I'm calling UV in the vineyards. So there's a link to a television story, but especially watch the video because uh, the son of grad school friends of mine is featured there. And the gist of it is that this is at, Oregon State in a project in collaboration with Cornell and Washington State. Hmm. And they're driving uh, UV light banks through experimental vineyards. And the UV uh, lights are in the in this thing and the, the, the vines are just getting moved. I mean, it's very close to the UV light source. And they're doing this at night to test the killing of powdery mildew. And powdery mildew uh, can't repair the UV damage as well at night. So that's why they're doing it at night. Um, and so it's it's kind of a cool idea. And I think it's not the 220 wavelength because they're wearing extensive uh, PPE. But they talk about how the speed of the travel uh, of the uh, vehicle 
affects the dose of the UV light that they're getting. Nice. So uh, another use for UV light and killing microbes. Nice. I didn't get through the whole video. I looked at the first part of it, and this was a, if I understand it correctly, a uh, an idea that dawned on them uh, in the process of uh, trying to put UV into their HVAC system to mm -hmm. uh, keep keep down the pathogens circulating there, and then somebody had the idea, oh. We could zap the grapes, right? Yeah, yeah that, I, I'm uh, not sure of the of the origin of this. Story, but, yeah. The one the one listener email we had suggesting putting the lights in HVAC ducts is, I think, is a good idea, right? It can sterile, it can inactivate mm -hmm. the air yeah. as it goes by mm -hmm. them. By the way, now I remember what I wanted to say, Brianne. Melbourne. Oh, Melbourne. Ah. They, when I went there, they said, "You just Melbourne. It's not Melbourne. It's Melbourne." Well, then I'll have to go so that I can learn. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just going to say someone's going to write in and tell you that we caught it. Rich, what do you have? So uh, last week <laughs> I talked briefly about how nature doesn't give a hoot uh, about, you know, nature <laughs> is basically amoral um, and right, doesn't yeah. give a hoot whether who lives and who dies. And whenever I think about that, I think about this particular uh, video that's a slow motion video. I think I picked this before, but I'm uh, doing it again. It's a slow motion video from the um, documentary series Planet Earth about a great white shark attack on seals. Hmm. And the deal is yeah. that this is a situation where these seals, in order to go to work every day, uh, and go fishing, have to run the gauntlet uh, of a bunch of great white sharks who uh, hang out there waiting to catch the seals. And uh, the photography is amazing. Yeah. Uh, it's a super slow motion of these giant beasts jumping up and grabbing onto one of these seals in their teeth. And it is just absolutely vicious. Uh, and that's what nature is. Mm -hmm. It's cruel. Yeah, they come up underneath yeah. them and throw them into the air. They kind of play with them too. It's really I feel yeah. bad for the seals. Yeah. By the Bye. way, uh, news just in: White House blocked the CDC order to keep cruise ships docked until February. Good move, oh, White great. House. Great. Yeah. great. All right, um, I, my pick is not science, but it's technology, and it has made me less stressed. So we have a garage door opener, right? Which you use to open and close the garage. And my daughter never closes the garage when she leaves. And for months, this has been stressing me out. In the middle of the night, she'll come home and leave it open. And I think someday someone's going to come in and kill us all or something. So I found this thing you hook up to the opener and it, and then it has an app on your phone and you can control it, but you can time it to close within X minutes after it's been opened. Automatically. Ah, okay. And I get a notice on my phone, your garage door has just been opened. Your garage door has just been closed. And now I can sleep at night because I know whenever she <laughs> comes in, it's going to close automatically. So if you have a, an automatic garage door opener and someone who can't remember to close it, it will do it. It's just, So the app controls, hey, look, garage door one is still open. Someone just went out. Probably her tailwind is going to close it at 1250. So it even tells you, and you can set it five, 10, 15, 30 minutes, whatever you want. I figured 15 minutes was, I am just, I have, grateful. I have an app because my, uh, <laughs> my garage door came pre-programmed so that I could do this, but I've never looked to see if I could do it I don't automatically. Know, get notifications or yeah. schedule it. I'm going to have to check this out a little closer. Yeah. You could probably automatically, and I know this is not for everyone, but. I feel one, yes, it is. one aspect of, of my life has calmed down because of this app, because it will close. And I have, you can get, you need one for each door. So we have two doors and I just unplug the other door so nobody can open or close it because we don't put cars in them anyway. There's no room. <laughs> but Tailwind is the company. Wow. And I put it in myself. It's not that hard. All cool. right. Cool. Twiv. You have to put a little doohickey on the rail so that it can sense when the door opens, right? And that's not hard. It just screws in on both sides and the wire goes back to your garage door opener. Twift 668. Uh, I, I just, by the way, scheduled out the rest of the year. We're not going to reach 700 this year. I thought we might early next year <laughs> reach 700. But the fastest 
run to, to uh, the next hundred that we've ever had. Uh, microbe.tv slash twiv is where you will find the show notes. Please send us your questions and comments, twiv at microbe.tv. And if you'd like to support us financially, microbe.tv slash contribute. So, you know, I'll have a link to this Tailwind garage door thing on Amazon. And if you want to buy it through there, we'll get a little Amazon. Uh, you could go to Cafe Press and get a T-shirt too. Yeah, look at that. <laughs> what Brienne has. This is the Twiv This Week in Virology. That's a nice one. And mm -hmm. uh, there are a bunch of others there and all kinds of stuff. Cafepress.com slash Twiv. And oh, you people have been buying merch like crazy uh, this year, which is cool. People are into it. I think that's amazing that people want to wear... You know, this stuff that I designed years ago and I put up there and hardly anyone bought it. Now people are into it. I think it's so cool. Right? I don't know. Maybe I'm silly. Ah, okay. Anyway. Brianne Barker is at Drew University on Twitter, Bioprof Barker. Thanks, Brianne. Thanks. It was great to be here. Rich Condit is an emeritus professor, University of Florida, Gainesville, currently residing in Austin, Texas. Thank you, Rich. Sure thing. Always a good time. Great to see you all. It's good. Kathy Spindler. Yeah, you did. <laughs> Kathy Spindler is at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. Thank you, Kathy. Thanks. This is a lot of fun. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.blog. I'd like to thank the American Society for Virology and the American Society for Microbiology for their support of TWIV and Ronald Jenkins for the music. This episode of TWIV was recorded, edited, and posted by me, Vincent Racaniello. You've been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next week. Another TWIV is viral. <laughs>